So welcome all, all. This is the ninth, I think if I remember well, the ninth uh, session in our uh, COVID induced series in quantum computing and simulation. Um, great pleasure to have uh, Dieter Yax, Professor Dieter Yax from Oxford with us. Um, Dieter is also a long-term visitor of CQT for a few years. Um, and he will be talking about some recent works they have been doing on um, complex quantum dynamics and open systems and dissipation and just non-stationary complex quantum dynamics to be specific. So as usual, the talk will be around 45 minutes. Um, you can put questions in the chat, either to, ideally to me, and I will pass them to Dieter whenever I can. And at the end, we can also uh, maybe uh, take a few via the microphones if um, not too many um, people. So without further ado, thank you very much for agreeing, Dieter, and the floor is yours. Well, first of all, thank you very much for in inviting me to give a talk here. I would, of course, have loved to be there in person, um, but that is impossible at the moment. So I'll kind of do my best remotely and talk about our latest work on dissipation-induced non-stationary uh, complex quantum dynamics. And so uh, before I start, I'd like to uh, thank the people who were majorly involved in, in this work. And this is uh, Joey Tindall, who is a PhD student of mine, Berislav Bukra, who is a postdoc and actually uh, carries out much of the research that I'll be talking about today. Carlos, um, who was a Marie Curie fellow in, in our group and has now moved on to Spain. And uh, also Jonathan Kultaut, who was uh, part of my group until about uh, one and a half years ago and has now moved on to masterworks. And the uh, papers that I'll mainly be talking about are listed uh, down here below. So the motivation for this work that we are doing is that when we look around us and look at uh, how the world behaves, we do see complex dynamics in um, most every part of our world. I mean, it's part of biology and uh, we have complex behavior in financial markets and of course, we all know that when we go to work every day in the morning, or not at the moment, but usually when we go to work in the morning, um, we do get um, you know, complex um, behaviors of, of traffic and, and other kind of interacting systems. And <clears throat> the one thing that all of these systems have in common is that they fail to thermalize. So these traffic jams never thermalize, um, stock market prices never really uh, become stationary and don't change anymore. And of course, also in biology, the main uh, goal of, of living organisms and, and living beings is to avoid thermalizing and, and dying and you know, stay active and, and undergo non-stationary dynamics. And when we look at the classical world, then it's pretty easy to come up with uh, models that describe such non-stationary behavior. So one of the examples that I show here is Conway's Game of Life, where we have very simple rules of how um, uh, the system should change from one generation to the next. And even with very simple rules, we can get quite complex behavior, as is shown here, for instance, for this situation where we have some kind of uh, breeder that produces little uh, kind of up shots and, and continues to uh, change and to evolve in a complex way. In contrast to that, basically, simple rules leading to complex dynamics, if we look at uh, quantum systems, the situation changes dramatically. Usually what we um, is expect in quantum systems is that as we go to a larger number of, of um, particles and have many particle systems, the situation is expected to be such that if we have a closed system, then defacing will lead to stationarity very quickly. So I indicate this here by this plot. So the red dot basically shows a coherence, kind of oscillate around. That's the kind of situation that we get for a single particle system. And that typically leads to um, observables oscillating in time. So that behavior for single particle systems can easily lead to non-stationary dynamics to ongoing oscillations. In contrast to that, when you look at a many body system, so that's shown in blue here, and you look at how various um, coherences evolve over time and how they add up, 
Then what typically happens is that after a very short time, and in this case here shown for just 500 coherences, the system becomes essentially stationary and it, it, it thermalizes according to the eigenstate thermalization hypothesis. So as soon as we grow the system size of a quantum system, most of the observables and the observables that we're interested in will thermalize because of all the different coherences uh, evolving at, at different uh, frequencies, adding all up and then basically producing something that looks stationary. <clears throat> in, if we have an open system, uh, then what we get is ergodicity, which predicts in most cases that what we do get is a situation that becomes stationary after letting the system run for a sufficiently long time. I show here the example of a loaded die. So if we have this, this loaded die and we actually throw it enough times, then what we get is over time a stationary distribution where basically all the different uh, probabilities of getting the possible different outcomes of, of, low, of, of throwing this die will become stationary and will not change over time anymore. And these two types of behaviors, which is what we mostly assume when dealing with uh, many body quantum systems, are of course completely contrary to all the kind of complex classical uh, dynamics that, that we see around us, where things do not thermalize and where things do not ever go into any kind of stationary system. And so the question that we're asking ourselves is how can we get to a situation where a quantum system shows this type of behavior? So where a quantum system does not thermalize, and instead of basically as shown here in this plot, exploring all of um, the available Hilbert space and thus thermalizing or, or defacing, um, we can get into a situation where the Hilbert space is basically divided up into different parts, out of which the system can oscillate into and out of, but most of Hilbert space is basically off limits for the system so that the resulting long-term dynamics is one that just happens within these individual uh, subspaces of the of Hilbert space. And so <clears throat> if we can achieve that kind of behavior, then what we can, can get is, non, is perpetual non-stationary dynamics. And I put perpetual here under quotes because of course what we will be looking at is idealized models and idealized models that um, will not contain any of the kind of imperfections that are always present in experiments. And so perpetual is meant to mean within the model that we are studying. And the way we're trying to achieve this type of behavior is through a combination of symmetry and dissipation. So what we want is dissipation to prevent eigenstate thermalization. And as you've seen on the previous slide, what eigenstate thermalization does is it makes all of your quantum correlations deface because there are so many quantum correlations um, contributing to the dynamics in most cases that they all add up with these different phases and thus any kind of dynamics gets lost very quickly. This is usually referred to as eigenstate thermalization hypothesis. And we want <coughs> symmetry to have a non ergodic behavior so that um, we can basically prevent the system from exploring all of, all of Hilbert space. And we're trying to kind of engineer or, or find conditions um, that would allow us to prevent eigenstate thermalization and to make the system sufficiently non ergodic to start to see some kind of non stationary um, oscillatory behavior in the quantum system at long times. <coughs> now, <clears throat> if you look at the usual uh, system dynamics, we can in quantum mechanics always write the evolution of a quantum state as just an exponential of the eigenvalues of the system dynamics times the individual uh, states, the individual eigenstates of the system. And this dynamics follows from uh, this evolution equation that I show here for a specific Hamiltonian that I will discuss a bit later. But what that ev evolution equation means is that if we look at how this system behaves and we look first at the closed system, so that system that is just described by Hamiltonian, then what we get here is that all these eigenvalues lambda i lie on the imaginary axis of a kind of complex space. And they will typically be dense on this imaginary axis. <clears throat> because they are dense on this imaginary axis, any evolution 
any kind of summing up of these different exponentials that we get up here will mean that this system is going to decrease very quickly. So what we do thus is we add some dissipative term, and this dissipative term will basically make that a number of those uh, those eigenvalues will acquire a negative real part, and that means that the corresponding eigenstates rho i here will over time damp out. So now with this dissipation in place, we have a system where many of the eigenstates will damp out over time and not um, play a role in the long-term dynamics. Usually what we are left with, <clears throat> if we add such a damping term, is a system that then has typically a state, a stationary state that is at zero at the origin of this uh, complex plane. And that stationary state then does not evolve anymore. And all of the observables that we can measure um, will acquire a stationary value, and that's the um, and, and that's the kind of stationarity, that's the ergodicity that I discussed uh, just before. Now, what we have, what we want then <laughs> is we would like to get a situation where we have additional points here on this imaginary axis, additional points that uh, take on discrete places on this imaginary axis that are sufficiently commensurate so that the contributions that we get in the long time dynamics from these points will actually lead to some uh, time dependent observables and prevent the system from ever becoming stationary. <clears throat> so the question that we are going to try to ask is, how can we get such additional points here and initial states that will have an overlap with those states so that this system can actually evolve um, even in the long time limit? And I'm going to uh, discuss how this can be done and what the implications are of having a system where basically most of these kind of contributions are stamped out and we are left with a system that is described by a stationary state here on this, uh, on this origin of the, of the map and some additional points here. <coughs> and so, <coughs> but, sorry. So what we will find is that there is a generic condition for getting these, these yellow dots on the imaginary axis. And this generic condition is that um, we find an operator A that behaves a bit like a um, racing or lowering operator for the Hamiltonian of the system. So if we have the condition that we can find an operator A such that it gives a commutator that is minus lambda times A with the Hamiltonian, and that operator commutes with these jump operators of the dissipation, if we have those conditions fulfilled, then we will get these yellow points here. Um, why does this work? Well, if this type of lowering operator exists, and I have put the conditions here again, what we can easily show is that any kind of uh, stationary state that the system will have, so this row zero zero here would be one stationary state on the origin here, that if we take that stationary state and apply these raising and lowering operators from the left and the right to this state, what we do get is another uh, state rho and m that will be another stationary state if n equals m. So it will be another state that is here on this green uh, spot here. But if n and m are different, so if you apply this operator A, different number of times from the left and from the right, then this uh, state rho and m will evolve with time in the way shown here. So it will oscillate with a frequency that is m minus n times lambda. And these oscillations will be perpetual and will arise basically from these yellow dot dots that I show here. Now these states rho and m uh, that are not on the diagonal are not necessarily physical states. So they will be trace zero states in, in most cases. And hence, because they are trace zero, these states, we will always need to have pairs of them. That's why I have got pairs of uh, these yellow dots uh, that are symmetric from the origin here. So we will always get both the rho nm and the rho mn. And those uh, states, those kind of what we call mixed coherences, they will actually lead to, to the um, perpetual oscillations in the system. Um, 
important to note here is that these mixed coherences are not necessarily decoupled from the environment. So if we take any of these states rho and m and we apply these jump operators from the left and the right here, in general what you will find is that this is non-zero. So that means that these rho and m's are not arc states of the system, they are induced, they are created by this dissipation and are not just the consequence of these types of states not interacting with the environment. So these conditions that are right here are different from conditions of decoherence-free subspaces where basically part of the system just doesn't talk to the environment. But here really what we have is we have a condition where these oscillations or these kind of long time evolution is described and is induced by the environment. And th that leads then to the notion of what we call a dark Hamiltonian, where basically we take an effective Hamiltonian that describes the evolution of just those states that are on the imaginary axis and assume that all these other states that are drawn in red here have them out after a sufficiently long time. So basically this approach then gives us a direct handle on the dynamics of the system after it's evolved for a long time and this dark Hamiltonian would allow us to basically describe the evolution of the system after any kind of transients have died out. Now, um, <clears throat> furthermore, in order to even you know, kind of uh, get, get more insights into this type of system, what we will assume is that, or what we will consider is jump operators, L, L mu, that are Hermitian operators. If these uh, L mu operators are Hermitian, then we know that the identity operator is a stationary state of the system. So we will have identity on this uh, green spot here. And hence we can now start building all of the states and these uh, mixed coherences from the identity operator, just applying these A operators from the left and the right. And hence what we get uh, from this construction then is a set, I'm not saying it's necessarily a complete set, but typically it is, a set of states that lie here on this axis and we get a very simple algebraic um, expression for those states on the imaginary axis. If we furthermore assume that the stationary state is then a function of conserved quantities only and we assume that all the other kind of degrees of freedom of this system kind of get to some maximum entropy state um, after a sufficiently long time, then Basically, we can assume that the system thermalizes within each of these symmetry sectors, and we can write this long-term state as just an exponential of the conserved quantities here and some Lagrange multipliers. So that's basically a generalization of the Gibbs ensemble that takes into account that the system can only equilibrate within each of the different symmetry sectors. And um, usually what we will assume here is that we have infinite temperature states because in most of these cases with these jump operators on, the H itself, the energy is not conserved and hence these states will typically be infinite temperature states, but they will still have structure because of this present symmetries because of these operators CI that we have here. And of course, because we assume infinite temperature states, um, we don't have to, the problem or the kind of challenge of working out what the actual thermal state is. We basically can just assume infinite temperature states and only need to deal with much simpler structures here where these um, conserved quantities appear in the station, in, in, this, in this kind of long time state. Now, to make this more concrete, let me now take a specific example and I'm going to use the Hubble model in the remainder of the talk to show how this type of dynamics, how this type of structure comes about. And um, having the Hamiltonian for the Hubbard model here, so this has uh, three parts that are probably very well known to each of you. There is uh, one term that describes the kinetic energy of the system. So basically here we have a fermion being destroyed in the site J with some spin sigma, and we recreate it in the neighboring site um, I again with spin sigma, and this uh, process is uh, controlled by some hopping, some tunneling parameter t. So basically what this term describes is the hopping of particles 
between different lattice sites in, in a lattice system. The next term here is an interaction term, where if two particles, one will spin up and one will spin down, sit on the same site I, then they will uh, feel an interaction energy U. So that basically means that compared to an empty site, what we will have is some energy offset U. And typically we will assume that this energy offset is larger than the tunneling rate, but for the purposes of for the general situation, this isn't really necessary. Then we have a chemical potential that controls the filling, so how many particles we have in the system. And we will assume that we can apply a magnetic field that basically shifts the upstates from the downstates in, in this type of system. Now, this type of Hamiltonian has got uh, two symmetries, a spin symmetry and a so-called ether symmetry. I'm going to describe the spin symmetry first. So we can de define uh, spin operators uh, that basically uh, study the difference between the number of n up and, 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 and down particles um, with an operator s z and we have an s plus and an s minus operator that create and destroy up and down particles so increase or decrease the balance between spin up and spin down particles. Now if we define these operators as z s plus and s minus then we find that these operators fulfill um, following algebraic equations if we take uh, the commutator of SZ with the Hubble model, we get zero. So the number of up and down particles is conserved. And this operator S plus and S minus commutes with the Hubble Hamiltonian exactly in the way that I described before. So this S plus and S minus operator has the form of a raising and lowering operator with the Hubble model, with the prefactor being the magnetic field. So that means that this parameter lambda that I had on, the, on one of the previous slides can be externally controlled by controlling the, the magnetic field. And this parameter lambda is also what sets the frequency of these uh, different oscillating terms. So this means that in this Hubble model, this parameter B, the magnetic external magnetic field, is able to, to change the um, frequency of oscillations in this system. Now, similarly, this model has a so-called eta pairing symmetry, where we now define um, eta pairs in a very similar way to the spins before. But if you now look at these operators, eta plus, eta minus, and eta z, those operators are completely without any kind of spin. So eta z uh, just measures how far the system is away from having single occupancy. So it measures the imbalance compared to half filling of the system. And eta plus and eta minus creates pairs of particles on one side. So here we always create an up and a down particle at the same side. So this is a spin independent operator. And these operators, eta z, eta plus, eta minus, fulfill the same um, commutation relations as the spin operators before. So the eta z operator commutes with the Hamiltonian and eta plus minus have this kind of lowering and raising uh, behavior, this time with the chemical potential as, um, the, as, as the prefactor that, that can set the, um, the oscillation frequency. Now, in this case, however, um, super selection rules will typically forbid us from seeing these types of oscillations that would have been induced by the chemical potential. I'm still going to talk about this symmetry because it leads to other kind of interesting uh, phenomena. So what I'm going to look at then is taking this system with these types of symmetries and uh, change it in two different ways. So we can change it either by making this uh, field here um, time dependent, so drive the system, uh, or we can change it by having this dissipation being present that I discussed before. So we just look at some dissipators that will um, make sure that most of the um, eigenstates of the Hubble Hamiltonian will decay and will damp out through some dissipation term. Now, as I said before, we will actually use these operators L to be Hermitian operators. So that means that one of the stationary states will then be the identity operator. And similarly here, if we uh, drive this system, then the general expectation is that the driven system will just go to an infinite temperature. And again, that means the identity will be the long-term stationary, the long stationary state of the system. So what we expect is that this type of driving that will take the system to infinite temperature 
behaves in a pretty much similar way to this type of um, dissipation with emission operators that would also like to take the system to um, a state that is simply the identity. Now, as I said, we look at couplings to two different sectors, and I will discuss what happens in these two different situations because of the two uh, symmetries that we have in the Hubble model. And first, I'm going to discuss what happens if the dissipation couples to the spin sector. And if it couples to the spin sector, what we, what we have is uh, long-range correlations between the eta pairs. So this is the situation where we don't get oscillations that I discussed before. But what we'll get instead is a superfluid state. And uh, oscillations are prevented here by the superselection rules. So we cannot have an initial state that really has overlap with these yellow dots that in principle would exist. And then I'm going to look at uh, dissipation in the charge sector. So where this operator L mu couples to the charge degrees of freedom, so the particle numbers. And in this case, indeed, we will see that stationarity is prevented and eigenstate stabilization is prevented and we will get these non-stationary uh, behavior that I mentioned at the very beginning. Uh, just a word on how this could be realized experimentally. Well, experimentally, you could basically create a Hubble model by having an um, atomic gas in an optical lattice made of, of fermions in the lattice and, for instance, dump that into a Bose-Einstein condensate and the kind of interactions between the lattice particles with the Bose-Einstein condensate will uh, lead to interactions that either deface on these particles uh, by coupling to the charge sector or to the spin sector purely depending on the scattering lengths between the particles in the lattice and the uh, Bose-Einstein condensate. So by using a Feshbach resonance, one can change these different scattering lengths and either make them equal to couple to the charge degrees of freedom or make them opposite to couple to the spin degrees of freedom. So in principle, that is possible and what does have control over how uh, a lattice system in atomic um, optical lattice setups can couple to, um, to, to an environment. <clears throat> now let's go first to coupling to the spin sector. And uh, let me start by, explain, by, by discussing a little bit what the um, spectrum of the Hubble model looks like. So if we look at the spectrum of the Hubble model and the low-lying states here, what we get is uh, competing orders and a corresponding decay of correlations. So if you look at, at ground states or near ground states of the Hubble model, um, what we see is that eta correlations, so correlations between these eta pairs that are created by these operators, eta plus, so where pairs of particles are created in a site, they drop off very quickly with distance between the lattice sites, here shown as the off diagonal parts of this um, correlation function here, because basically this order competes with order of the in the spin of degrees of freedom and hence prevents any kind of long range, long range correlations between eta pairs. If we then move up in the energy spectrum and go to highly energetic states, we see a very different behavior. In this high energy uh, sector, there are states where these eta pairs show long range correlations and where these correlations can extend over the whole system. So we do get off diagonal long range order and well, as was shown in this kind of seminal paper by Young in 1989 already, these type of eta paired states show superconductivity. So as soon as there is long range correlation between eta pairs, what we get uh, is a superconducting or superfluid state in these systems. Now, of course, if you wanted to just drive this system um, by increasing its temperature and or, or drive it to an infinite temperature state, then of course all of these kind of different eigenstates would be involved in the dynamics and these specific states with the long range correlations would not be visible. So the task that we are now looking at is whether with this kind of additional symmetry and this kind of more specific driving, can we actually get the system into a regime where we see these kind of long range correlations. And basically the idea is that um, what we do well, what we want to do is we want to uh, drive or dissipate this system by just coupling to the spin sector. And if we imagine the whole of the Hubble model as basically having these two sectors here, a spin sector and an eta sector, if we couple to the spin sector only and drive this spin sector 
to infinite temperature without touching the eta pairs, then what we would expect is that this spin correlation is destroyed and will give a very high temperature state. But since the two symmetries are separate and we don't touch the eta symmetries, the eta degrees of freedom are then free to develop long range order. And uh, that's what we, what we tested. So basically we now look at this system coupling it dissipatively only to the spin degrees of freedom and let the system run and what from the ground state. And what you see here is that after a very short time, indeed long range correlations between the eta pairs are built up and all the spin degrees of freedom get very short range correlations. So the spin degrees of freedom are heated up to infinite temperature, but the eta degrees of freedom are not heated up and hence develop this long range correlation. And um, we can show this using this approach that I mentioned at the very beginning um, by looking at what are the conserved quantities. So we have conserved quantities here. We write down the corresponding stationary state where each of these conserved quantities is given um, Lagrange parameter and note that this is not a, a standard um, stationary state of, of thermal form because while n up and n down here are really kind of single particle extensive quantities that usually experiences appear in these exponents, this eta plus eta minus term is a quadratic term. So that's a term that usually does not appear in, in thermal states. And if we then assume a state of this form, what we find is that if we let if, if we have a state of this form, any eta correlations must be long range. So this is something one can show uh, quite easily analytically, but just assuming that we need to have um, translational symmetry in the system, and that immediately leads to these eta correlations to be uh, long range. So what we now have, however, is only a kind of interesting structured state here in this uh, stationary state because of these additional conserved quantities here, and that state develops some long range order and hence will be a superfluid or superconducting state. We can check this by really projecting the system into the spin degrees of freedom and into the eta degrees of freedom. So we take this long time state, and if you project into the spin degrees of freedom, we find the state is indeed a diagonal state, very high temperature state, infinite uh, temperature essentially with no long range correlations. But if we project this into the eta degrees of freedom, we find a pretty much um, off we, we find long range off diagonal order, low temperature, and a highly entangled state. So this really shows that the presence of these two symmetries and being able to drive just one of these two sectors to infinite temperature leads to an interesting state in the other uh, sector of this of this system. Now, similarly, um, as I mentioned before. We can choose to now either drive the system to infinite temperature by some external driving that only talks to the spin degrees of freedom or couple it um, to infinite temperature by um, just doing a dissipation. Just this. And basically here I show what happens if you drive the system instead of just taking the system and coupling it to an environment. And what we see is that indeed the same thing happens that, you would, that we did get for the coupled uh, system. So basically here we have again the prediction from this analytical state that I showed before. And here's the actual dynamics of the system and the, for the eta correlations. And we see that after a very pretty short amount of driving time, this system really goes to the predicted state. And importantly here in this case, this doesn't need any fine tuning. This result follows from the symmetry of the system. So that means that uh, how we exactly drive this system uh, doesn't really matter. The time dependence of this B field here is more or less uh, irrelevant as long as it only talks to the spin degrees of freedom. So that gives this kind of dynamics here some robustness. And you can also see this, these two different plots here are for very different types of driving and they always essentially lead to exactly the same type of evolution. Now, um, the, the physics that I discussed so far all emerges from this kind of particular symmetry. Now we looked at what happens if you move away from this symmetry, because this symmetry is only present in bipartite lattices. 
And as soon as we have a non-pi polytonic lattice, uh, the symmetry is, is broken. And the question is, how close to a bipartite system does one have to be in order to see any of this physics? And would it be possible to see this even if we move away from a bipartite system? So what we did was we studied a triangular lattice with uh, diagonal hoppings shown here as tau of t and vertical hoppings shown here as tau dash. And basically, if this tau dash is um, non-zero, then we do have a non pi polar lattice and we get a frustrated system here where particles can hop in these triangles. So if tau dash is equal to zero, this is a bipartite lattice, so it has the symmetries we just discussed before. If the tau dash is non-zero, then um, we don't have a bipartite lattice and in principle don't have this symmetry. In addition, now we don't try with a, a magnetic field, but we assume that what is driven here is the hopping rate itself. And so both of those now mean that we do not really kind of uh, talk to the specific spin symmetry anymore, but we have a much more complicated setup. It turns out, however, that this type of triangular setup has a, well, has a, has a phase diagram where the phase that is close to uh, this line here where we have bipartiteness is a, is a spin wave condensate. So basically the state can approximately be written as the vacuum and then apply the S plus operator uh, to this state. And this is a good approximation for this uh, phase one that we have here. It turns out that if we take this uh, type of state here and apply the vertical hopping operator on that state, it acts as an annihilation operator. So basically it destroys this state to have a hopping that goes up and down these rungs here, these vertical rungs. And because of that, this uh, excitation pathway is shut down. Because this acts as an annihilation operator, it cannot create pairs of particles in there. And the, hence this kind of frustration that leads to this kind of spin wave condensate means that even if we move away from the bipartite lattice here in this kind of triangular structure, what we get is a robustness in the number of eta pairs. And the number of eta pairs is approximately conserved because they can't be created by this additional term here. Now, what that means for the dynamics is that similarly to the case before, if we look at eta correlations, we do get very large eta correlations if we just let the system evolve and, and drive it as we've seen before, as long as we are in this phase one where the system is close to a spin wave condensate. If we then move beyond this phase into phase two as shown here, these eta correlations are gone very quickly. And basically there is a relatively sharp transition between this behavior and this behavior exactly at the point where we move here from phase one into phase two. And what I said before that this um, operator HV, so the vertical hopping acts as a, essentially as a destruction operator is shown here. So if we are in this phase number one, uh, the overlaps here are close to zero. So, so that means that we do have basically uh, no excitations there. But if we move beyond that, if we move into this phase two, then what we get is a strong creation of pairs of in this system because of this vertical hopping. So what this shows is that you know, while the arguments that I made before are strictly valid because of symmetry reasons, only on, on this line where tau dash is zero, even if we move away from this in say a triangular lattice, uh, then because of this nature of the spin wave condensate, um, we may see uh, similarly see a long range eta pairing in these systems. And that's of course something that was done experimentally in uh, this kind of complicated complex um, molecule here uh, just a little while ago, where basically the system was shaken in a way that these two different hoppings, tau dash and tau, were changed with time. And what they saw was that indeed the reflectivity and the conductivity in the system showed behavior that is consistent with the development of some superfluidity in this system so at sufficiently low enough temperatures, what happens if they drive the system is the reflectivity goes up to one and the conductivity here develops a kind of one over omega dependence 
which is consistent with superconductivity emerging in this in this system. And uh, only if you go to two large temperatures, where then basically pairs are broken up and there is no coherence left anymore in this system, then basically this behavior disappears. Now let me in the final few minutes now come to coupling to the charge sector, where basically what we look at now is a dissipative process that does not couple to the spin degrees of freedom, but couples directly and only to the charge. And in this case, we make the same uh, assumptions as before. We assume that the stationary state here the, on the green dot here is a function only of the conserved quantities. And now these conserved quantities are the total number of particles as plus, as minus, and as z. And then we can now generate these kind of mixed coherences that I mentioned at the beginning of the talk. And these will be physically relevant now because initial states can be a superposition of various different numbers of spin ups and spin down states. And that means that these rho and m's, these yellow dots here, will in general have an overlap with the initial state. And so what we can expect is the large parts of the system will just damp out, but then we will get dynamics that is ongoing because of these mixed coherences perpetually oscillating. And I show this here for a very simple initial state where we have a chain, a Hubbard chain, two spins to the right initially, one spin to the left, and so on repeating. And we can look now, for instance, at the expectation value of the x component of the spin. And we do see that after some, some short transient, this starts to give uh, perpetual oscillations that are constant and that don't decay. We can work out what analytically from uh, the approach that I showed before, how this uh, amplitude of oscillations change with system size. And in particular, we find that this is not a finite size effect, but that in the thermodynamic limit, we get a non-zero um, oscillation, uh, oscillation amplitude here that does never go to zero. And we also see that the frequencies at which these quantities oscillate are sharp and are determined directly by the magnetic field that is applied. So changing the magnetic field now allows to change these oscillation periods of these spins. Now this all looks a bit as if it could be just uh, the precession of a giant uh, single spin, but that is not the case. So if we look at how this system behaves by looking at individual trajectories, then what we do find is that only if we look at the maximum spin state, so where initially all of these spins are aligned in the same direction, do we get just simple precession of a spin. So that would be precession of a, a spin in a simple single particle way without any of the uh, quantum physics playing an important role. But if we go to this initial state that I showed before, where two spins point to the right and one spin points to the left, and then we look at individual trajectories, then we see that the behavior of this system is not at all like a single spin processing. What happens here is that each trajectory individually will undergo some noisy evolution shown by the dots here. So the dots are just snapshots of each of these individual trajectories. And the trajectories will have an uncertainty that is indicated by this gray line here. So that shows that this system does not just uh, kind of lead to a spin precession where all of these spins precess in, in sync, but basically that there is still some fluctuation around and only if we average over the ensemble, if we average over many trajectories, do we get a single trajectory that looks like a kind of single spin processing. We can make this notion firmer and actually look at, does this really mean that we have some complex dynamics where the evolution of the system arises from the interactions and from kind of the noise that is present by looking at two quantities that are often used in complexity to analyze um, the dynamics of a system. We use the mutual information. So the mutual information between the dynamics in different sites. And here, for instance, I have the mutual information between the dynamics in site one and in site three. So that mutual information tells us how much we can learn about what goes on in site three by measuring site one. And if we 
study that mutual information with no dissipation on, we see that the mutual information shown here in blue can be reasonably large. So measuring what happens inside one tells us uh, what happens inside two. If, however, we turn on the dissipation, and that is what is necessary to see the spin precession that I showed before, then the mutual information drops down. So that means that because of the dissipation being switched on, um, there is very little we can learn about side three by measuring side one. And so the two, uh, the two different sides, the spins in the two different sides evolve in an uncorrelated way. So they are not really tied together very closely. The second thing that we can look at then is the disparity between the different sides. And the disparity tells us how different the different sites are. So whether they still do the same thing, just don't have any mutual, mutual information, but in principle do the same thing, or whether they are doing different things. And again, we show this for um, gamma equals zero. So when there is no dissipation and we find the disparity that is relatively small. And if we increase the dissipation, the disparity goes up here. So that means that as we increase dissipation, we do see more different behavior in the different sites. Now, both of these taken together, the fact that in the dissipative case, we have a low mutual information between different sites, and we have a large disparity between different sites, means that the state that we get, <clears throat> the microscopic state that we get, cannot easily be described by, um, by pen and paper, essentially, because all the sites behave differently, and there's very little mutual information, so it's a state that is, in the usual language, is a complex state that is difficult to describe. And also this behavior here of mutual information and disparity shows that this physics is not at all like a single spin processing where we would get very different behavior for those, these two quantities here. Now, what I showed before is actually, or can be seen as a limit cycle so we can look at the long time dynamics of this system and corresponding observables. And what we do find that um, there are coherent non-decaying limit cycles in various different observables. And that basically shows that this type of symmetry and dissipation can lead to notions that we usually have for a semi-classical evolution of the system, but now in a system that does not have a semi-classical limit. There is no semi-classical limit for the Hubble model. And so usual mean field approaches and so on don't work. But here we still get notions of um, complex uh, semi-classical dynamics showing that um, you know, even without having a well-defined semi-classical limit, this type of dynamics can emerge from uh, purely microscopic quantum models. And we analyzed the, um, the stability of these and what we find is that these limit cycles are stable at least to lowest order, and hence perturbations or small perturbations to this type of system would still preserve these limit cycles. And in particular, um, uh, working out observables just like, like the Pearson correlation coefficient over a rolling time window, again show what we discussed before, that we have some very short initial transient period of time, and after that, the different um, the dynamics of the system is uh, pretty much correlated and shows these kind of limit cycles that uh, we've seen on the previous slide. And as we turn on the perturbations, you can also see here that these different uh, hallmarks of how synchronized the system is <laughs> behaves quite nicely. So as we uh, perturb the system away from the ideal setting at zero here, the negativity and the off dynamical coherences remain for a very long time, even if we have small perturbations here. So that shows that we can get uh, complex dynamics of this system that leads to interesting non-stationary dynamics in the long time limit because of our construction uh, of being able to work out what these states are that survive in the long time limit we can get an analytical handle on this and study the long-term dynamics without having to resort to numerics. And that, of course, means that we do not have to struggle with going through the intermediate transient uh, period of time in, in large systems, but can focus on the long-term limit where only a relatively small number of states survives. 
Now with this, I would like to, uh, to stop and uh, thank all of the PhD students and postdocs and academic collaborators that we've been working um, on over the past few years. And in particular, again, point out Carlos, Barry, Slav and Joey, who have been helping with this work and, and basically Barry Slav has done a, a lot of this work and has been really leading this and uh, done an excellent job on that. As this, I thank you very much. And I hope that you know, I can give another talk sometime in the future in person again, which I have to say uh, would be great to get out again. Thank, thank you. Thanks, thanks, um, thanks, Dieter. It was uh, really um, nice. And yes, it would be great to have you back to Singapore and uh, you know the talks usually follow with some chili crab and beer but not not this time uh, <laughs> yeah. so the we have time for questions um, um, you I think we are a small group reasonably small group today so if you just you can you can just directly ask um, Dieter and, and just state your name and, and affiliation for everybody's um, uh, information and then just ask. Any questions? Hi, I'm Dario. Uh, Hi, Dario. Hi. Hi, Dario. How are you? Um, I wanted to ask uh, for, for start, uh, what happens if the dissipation that you use to fill the data pairing at this interesting thing is uh, only, only acts locally and not over the whole system? What kind of uh, that you're going to achieve in the state eventually. It doesn't act uh, homogeneously on the old, old system, but only on the small portion of the system. Yes, so we do. I mean, we, we, we're currently looking at um, what happens if you have local, um, local dissipation. And there is even a, I didn't talk about this, there is a paper on the archive where we have looked at local dissipation. And there's also one example in our, um, in, in one of the papers where we looked at local dissipation, and there basically um, the, the the stationary state is not as easy to write down. So you know we, you you have a more complex this stationary state, and so much of I mean the the kind of simple arguments that I gave before that the identity will be your um, stationary state isn't isn't necessarily true anymore. And um, there the physics gets uh, more more complex. I think what we find is some type of many body decree and free subspace in some of these cases. We find uh, domain walls that are stable. So domain walls that do not decay despite having um, uh, um, dissipation in the system. <clears throat> and um, the other thing we find is that in some of these cases, in one of these situations, you can use uh, a beta answer still to solve the problem and, uh, and, and study the physics from, from, from the beta answer. So uh, in principle, you know, the same arguments apply, but the, but the, the calculations become more uh, involved, I would say, in this case. But you know, if you choose this nicely, you can still do a lot of, of things. And, you know, we, as I said, we have in, in the appendix of, of the, Nature communications paper that I cited at the beginning, uh, the the boundary dissipation spin chain is in the is in the supplemental material, and we discuss exactly what the physics is there. Mm -hmm. um, I I have a follow up on that actually. Um, so so your L's now were constructed to satisfy this commutation relation, right? L yeah, if I remember, A equals zero, right? And A commutes with a Hamiltonian. Uh, oh no, it doesn't commute. H H A was proportional to A times a yes. negative factor. So I guess that's why you your L's are non-local in this case. They are not uh, uh, because your Hamiltonian. When you when, what was your L in the simulation? How, how did you? No, no, no. The, the L is not non non-local. The L is still local. But the L is such that it commutes with this operator A. So basically, the L. Um, I thought, so, yeah, I was confused there because I th you said that 
on, 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 on Darius' comment that is uh, on one side. So I thought they're, they are acting on local sides, right? Yes, oh. but, 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 but on all sides. So basically here ah. what we have is we have a sum over all the sides. Oh. And on each side locally, the, uh, the dissipator... Ah, so they act the same in the whole chain, yes, but they are they local. Act the same in the whole chain. Yes, yeah. okay. that's, that's what And because mean. they act the whole in the same chain, you know, that basically, and, and if we can look at, at just basically one term in this sum here mm -hmm. and look at the boundary dissipation only, and we did that, um, it's, you know, and it gives very interesting physics. And as I said, you know, we recently found uh, stable domain walls in this situation, mm -hmm. and we found um, decreased free subspaces, many body decreased so, free subspaces. So, so, so this is different, this is not. This is not this whole story that you know you could have a dark state as a BC state. You have you could, you know, there was this early works by Peter Choller's group and some other guys that yeah. you could, and then you you your L's basically drive you to the BC as the as the as the state. Uh, this is not that class driving. This is something different. No, basically this is different you, because you basically, have the symmetries, yeah, yeah. Because basically, in, in what what you can do also is you can of course get dark states from that. But, you know, remember, these are not dark states. So in, in our case here, and that's what I tried to show here. Yeah, this was in the beginning, the major difference, yeah. Basically, you, 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 the states that you get here are induced by the dissipation. So you need the dissipation. These are not dark states. These are not, I mean, the, the dissipation is not chosen in such a way that it commutes with your, mm. with the states that you want to reach. Mm. The dissipation commutes with this operator A, it commutes with, uh, with the raising mm. and lowering operator. Of yes, course, this is. does contain uh, the other case. This, this in principle, you can generate dark states with that. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and basically, just if you, if you take the A operator as being um, a projector onto a dark state, then of course you can generate dark states with that. But the A operators that I have, these S plus and, and eta plus, eta minus, are not projectors on the eigenstates. And hence, these states that we get here are not dark states. And in particular, you know, they, they are induced, they are created by the dissipation. They are not shielded from the dissipation. And that's also why I showed at the end, when you actually switch off the dissipation, you don't get any of the physics that we that we find. You do not get any oscillations because basically, uh, eigenstate generalization will will kill that, and the states that we do get are not decreased free subspaces. They are not decoupled mm -hmm. from the yeah. environment. Yeah. Um, I have a few more questions, but I'll get the audience to ask first, and maybe we can chat afterwards. So I see a raised hand by somebody, Chung Jung. Uh, uh, yes, hi. Please, please go ahead. Uh, yeah. Hi. Uh, thank you for nice talk. Indeed. Uh, I'm from Korea Institute for Basic Science, and indeed I'm a PhD student at Dr. Daniel Lakin. Uh, huh, yeah. Okay. So anyway, so thank you for yes. nice talk. I have uh, uh, three questions, which is very very conceptual question. I think uh, you mentioned about the jump operator, which uh, is eta form, right? Uh, so, yes. but uh, I'm, because indeed uh, in the microscopic origin, it has uh, some, uh, it is, uh, can be achieved from the uh, system part of interaction Hamiltonian somehow. So I'm wondering what's the microscopic origin, that kind of eta operators here. Can you explain briefly? How do we obtain so, uh, that kind of interaction? No, we, I mean, basically, the, the eta operators are just kind of describe the eta pairing symmetry of the Hubbard model. So the Hubbard model doesn't need any of the eta pair operators. It's just that these operators describe the symmetry and have these properties here. So we don't need any eta interactions in any way. And later, when we then basically write down the state of the system, let me just go there. We, the having this eta, um, where was this? Having the eta state in the, in, in here, you mean, is mm -hmm. does not mean that we need it as part of the Hamiltonian. So basically, this stationary state is an infinite temperature state. So there's no Hamiltonian in there. 
all that we put in here are the conserved quantities. And so none of these terms must really appear physically as an interaction in the Hamiltonian or you know, we don't need eta interactions. Maybe I misunderstood your question, but uh, basically uh, yeah, do because uh, I have a concept like a jump operator. It's like a, a system part of interaction Hamiltonian once we take a whole microscopics into account, like an interaction between system and bus. Oh, an interaction between system and part. Yes, so an yeah, interaction yeah. between system and part, there will be assumed, for instance, is um, if you have an optical lattice setup where the fermions sit in, in the optical lattice and you in, immerse that into a Bose condensate, then what happens is that these fermions will in, start interacting with the Bose condensate particles. And typically mm -hmm. this happens via density-density interactions. And um, what one then can show, and this is in a, an old paper that we did in 2006, you can show that that interaction leads to defacing of the particles inside the lattice. And this defacing for spin up and spin down particles is determined by the scattering length of the spin up scattering and the spin down scattering with the Bose condensate. And that means that the general term, so in general, if you immerse a, a lattice into a Bose condensate, you will get defacing operators that are of the form that I show here. Mm -hmm. Okay, there's no eta terms here, this is just density terms yeah, here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And now uh, these values of the spin up and spin down scattering length, they depend on the atom parameters and the atom properties and can be changed uh, through Feshbach resonances, for instance, or, or through the choice of uh, atomic species. And if those two are now equal, those two scattering lengths, then you see that the spin dependence drops out here and you get an operator L mu that is purely dependent on the, on the density of particles. If they are opposite and one is attractive and the other one is repulsive, then you get an, an operator that is purely spin dependence, it doesn't depend on the density anymore. And so by changing the scattering lengths here, you can tune the system to either couple to the charge or to the spin sector. Now I looked uh -huh. in this talk at the two extreme cases where we either have this situation or that, and basically couple the dissipation only to charge or spin degrees of freedom. And of course, in reality, you will not be able to do this, um, implement this ideally, so we also looked at deviations from that. And you know, in, in the papers, we discuss what happens if you have a bit of unwanted dissipation in these cases. And we show that a, a few percent of, of wrong uh, dissipation, if you will, still allows you to uh, see the physics that we described. Uh -huh. yeah, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I have uh, another question. So. Uh just maybe let's just see if there is anything else from the audience and then okay. Uh, okay. maybe you can ask after anybody in another question sorry to interrupt just to make sure that we keep the balance anybody any other question by anybody else at this stage okay while people are thinking please go ahead ask your third question Jun, Jun, uh, Jun. yeah okay yeah uh, i will go ahead yes uh, yes please you uh, you mentioned that for the long uh, let's say long lasting steady state uh, you require some condition like uh, commit some operator commute with jump operator uh, which is kind of condition right to obtain the kind of degenerated steady state of Lindbrad is it correct yes yes so um so basically, in order to see the physics that um, I described today, in order to see, basically, in, to have this, I mean, you will always have a spectrum of this type. So yeah. what happens in most cases is that um, in a dissipative system, most of these kind of states that you have in a closed system will damp out, mm -hmm. and you're yeah. left with only a stationary state. And so that's yes. the standard situation and in, in yeah. cases where you know uh, the chump operators are emission like i had today 
this stationary state will typically be the identity operator. So it will be a pretty boring state that has no structure in it. So that, you know, it's not very interesting to study in a way. So in order to get something that is more interesting and that we can get a handle on and, and it's not just a simple single stationary structureless state, what we need is these conditions here. So as soon as you have those conditions fulfilled and you have basically an operator A that typically arises from some symmetry of the Hamiltonian here mm -hmm. that acts like an um, raising or lowering operator and this operator A commutes with the dissipators, then basically you're left with states here on this axis that are more interesting than just the identity operator here. And in particular, you know, you'll have these yellow uh, dots here that will give you perpetual dynamics that will actually oscillate forever. And typically, because of the construction that I showed, you will get multiple stationary states. And so these multiple stationary states that we have here are then also not just identities and they will have structure. And that's yeah. one thing I showed is the structure of these states for the eta paired states, where basically what you get is a superconducting state because of these long range correlations. And that comes about because of this property here, that we can take any um, stationary state and find these states on the imaginary axis by applying these operators A and A dagger on the left and the right. So, you know, if you apply these operators and say if this is the S plus or S minus, S minus and S plus operators, each time you apply them, same number of times from the left and the right, you will generate a new stationary state. If you apply them an unequal amount of times, you will generate some of these yellow dots. And that means that we know what these states are. We can work out the overlap with the initial state and work out what the long time dynamics is. Uh -huh. Yeah, so indeed I asked this question because uh, as far as I know, uh, I mean the condition like uh, whether operator commutes with jump operator is both some kind of strong symmetry, but yes. even though they don't commute, uh, there can, I mean the spectrum of Lindbergian can exhibit kind of multiple steady state, like uh, uh, consider Lindbergian itself as a super operator and consider as a uh, computation between super operators, so it's called weak symmetry, as far as I remember. But yeah, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm not saying that this is a necessary condition, and this is a yeah, sufficient yeah, yeah. condition. Yeah, and I so, think you know, it is so. It turns what turns out to be the case is that these conditions that I have here are in general not, um, not sufficient conditions, they are um, and sorry, not necessary conditions, so they are sufficient to see this behavior but they are not Yeah, necessary. it's insufficient. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And they are not necessary if your, and we can show that if your stationary state is not invertible, then you know, there are other kind of situations as well. Um, and uh, then there is a more complicated uh, set of uh, conditions that we believe are necessary and sufficient that are that in the limit where your stationary state is invertible. It's a full rank state lead to this kind of uh, condition. Okay, state. I think. But you're um, right. Yeah, there can yeah. be other. There can be other. Um, there can be other reasons for having this type of behavior as well. In the well, situations that we looked at, we didn't get any of that. So you know, you need you need to have a very well tailored model and you know specific parameters, I believe to see these other types of states in all the kind of mm. um, generic settings and general parameters that we use, we never saw, saw that. But of course, you know, there are these kind of quantum scars and other things that you can generate. Usually they are, are more delicate than these kind of uh, symmetry conditions. Mm. Okay, let me, yeah. let me, yeah, thank let you, me. thank you. Bro. Yeah. Thanks, mm -hmm. thanks both of you, it's a nice set. Uh, maybe you can also take some things over email later on, there's more interest or um, sure. So, yes. any more questions? Any other comment questions? I, I already asked a question. Can I ask another one? Yes, please, please. Well, let's make it short, or maybe we can do yeah, the very, very short. Go ahead. Okay. Um, so, the it, it, for example, the eta pair correlation that you see, they are long range, and they seem to be long range independent of the dimensionality of the system. So, I wonder. Uh, 
um, for example, what happens if you switch it off, the dissipation, uh, what will happen to the dynamics after that, or, or whether it's correct that this is independent of the dimensionality of the system? Yeah, yes, you're right. It's independent of the dimension of the system. So this is um, dynamics that, uh, in, in, in the case that I discussed mostly, only depends on the system being bipartite. So this works in any dimensions. And you know, we looked at the triangular structure where you know, something similar happens. So if you have uh, triangles starting to, to be present and you go away a bit from this bipartite structure, it seems that you still get the same thing. And of course, that's precisely the situation that is realized in this experiment that I mentioned briefly. Um, if you switch off uh, this uh, dissipation, and if you switch off the um, driving, then of course the system will start to thermalize again, and um, and and uh, the the long range correlations will will be lost over time due to various uh, different imperfections and other dynamics that goes on. Um, the the interesting question that we are trying to answer at the moment is whether we can actually combine this dissipation or driving that we do with a way of generating mm, these mm. pairs and to basically have a, have a protocol that has different steps on creating additional pairs and then um, making them long range and hence prevent the system from relaxing back to some kind of thermal state through a combination of different types of driving so different types of dissipation that are, are switched between that would be ideal because that would allow this uh, type of state to remain permanently. Yep. I or have a quick, but, but long, a, long time. A quick thank question. Thank you. As we take the questions at this session, I guess we have a few of us. Um, um, that's, uh, you, you haven't mentioned anything about disorder. So all this, um, you know, non-thermalization, violation of the ETH, et cetera, et cetera. We're used to think of it in terms of many body localization, that there is some disorder there that does this. Um, uh, obviously, this is different. And we're talking about an open system, a driven open system. And you saw that in some cases, um, uh, we can get st non stationary states. But would you say this is many body localization? Would you call this many body localization or, or is it? No, I, I wouldn't call it that. Okay. <laughs> I, I'd like to stay out of, out of All this if I can. Right. Uh, but but just, just one thing, I, I think, you know, what one thing I, I was actually saying, in some parts, this was, was this can be driven. So I, we did not consider driven anticipative. So in, in the cases that I showed at first, the system is either dissipative or can be driven. Uh, you didn't both, put both do the same thing. But, but both do the same thing. So if you put both, you, you probably get the same you, thing. You don't consider any disorder anywhere. Everything was fixed. Um, no, so I didn't, but basically, you know, in the second part where we couple to um, the, let me just show here, uh, in coupling to, to the charge sector, there, of course, you can allow a trapping potential that does not change mm -hmm. the symmetry. So this epsilon i's in there can be arbitrary. So you, you can, can put this order in there. You can put this order there. You can put this order there. It doesn't change the stationary state. It doesn't change the conserved quantities because this is all just in the spin degrees of freedom. So all of this physics that I show here would be equally present if you had this order in, in, the, in the lattice side uh, potentials. The first part there, this is different. So if you couple to the spin degrees of freedom, you can't allow this trapping potential or this order. But in the second part, to see the spin, um, Procession or the spin oscillations, disorder wouldn't wouldn't matter. I mean, this type of disorder wouldn't matter. And in general, anything that does not change the symmetry, yeah, as long as the symmetries are staying the same, yeah, the key does does not matter. Yeah. And one last question before we end this, um, you know, this open photonic systems, you know, that we also kind of consider together, where. Um, um, it would always was kind of an open holy grail to try to find some sort of stationary state behavior that has some sort of long range order or long range coherence 
like I'm talking about cavity arrays, driven DCPT photonic systems and so on. Uh, are, do you see any of this being possible to be applied there or is again the way that the things are engineered and, and the A's and the L's will probably not lead to some um, realistic case to be, um, to be done? Um, well, I, I mean this here of course we, we use the, um, the fermionic Hubble model and that has these two symmetries. So that gives you a nice kind of um, structure to yeah, play to with one or the on, other. Yeah, to build on, yeah. And, and I think that you'd always want, uh, it, it essentially always depends on, do you know what the, what the symmetries, do you have enough of these symmetries to be able to engineer this type of state? Now I think in most of these cavity arrays, you do consider a bose hubble model. And um, yeah. there, of course, we don't have a similar and you're also very, very bounded by your L's. They're very fixed by the system reservoir interaction. The, so you don't have much freedom to play with the L's so much. Yes. yes. Yeah. yeah. And so that, that is always the main constraint. So basically what you need is you need to find um, a nice operator A that you know, leads to, um, to oscillations so that, that leads to a kind of structure here on this imaginary axis that you can deal with and that you can describe. And, um, and, and that requires these symmetries. I mean, of course there can be accidental, as I said before, there can be accidental such states and they can arise for other reasons. But you know, I believe that really to be able to work with them and to, to study them, it's very useful to have these operators A because that just gives you access to, to long time properties and to stationary states and, and non-trivial stationary states. And um, yeah, I mean, there may be other ways of doing it, but, but I think that symmetries are really a, a very good way of, of analyzing this. Okay, okay, so, so I think probably this is a good point to stop if there are no other questions or comments. Anybody else wants to? If not, thank you very much, really. It was uh, really good to um, hear what you guys are up to these days. Thanks the audience. Uh, I'll drop you a line. Maybe we can continue chatting uh, in another uh, call afterwards if you have time. I'll send you the link. Okay. All right. So thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye bye. And uh, you, in two thank weeks' you, time, in two weeks' time, we're going to have um, Peter Choller's group talking about uh, some of the recent works as well. I'll advertise it. Um, uh, probably next week. Bye-bye. All right. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Thanks for Bye. listening. Bye-bye.